Good afternoon and welcome to another webinar of the Global Progressive uh, Forum. Today, we're having it together with also the Migration Working Group of the S&D Group in the European Parliament. So, Pedro, welcome also here. I'm, I'm quite glad that you're here. Uh, uh, with us because you are vice president of the SD group, a, a colleague, and chairing also the working group on migration of the SD. So, what's about what we will deal today yeah. with? Thank you, Andreas. Yes, uh, the idea is for us today to have a bit of a different working group. Normally, this is about uh, discussion between now as members of the parliament on, on the migration policies, and also we invite experts as we'll have today. Um, but we thought it was a very good idea, and thank you for accepting this idea, to have it within the Global Progressive Forum uh, initiative. I think it's obviously very important. This policy is a priority for us, and it's a priority for our progressive families. So I think it was great that we could, that we could have this, uh, this discussion today. And we will be uh, dedicating particularly to um, community-based sponsorship and to, and to the hosting of the refugees. So it's asylum policy, but particularly the resettlement and the hosting of the refugees. That's where we'll want to go with the discussion today. So it is, I think, also for, for the people who are watching us online. So it's also a, a unique position that now s and Working Group, which usually is internally, is also publicly broadcasted. So we put together two good things. You mentioned resettlement is, is one of, of, of the, the issue, a term which describes what happened when refugees are moved from one place to the other and, and are living there. So it's also about integration, how it can work and function. Yeah. Yes, indeed. I mean, community sponsorship, it's a, it's a, a very critical program within the resettlement program that we have. And the idea is to put people, local people, at the heart of the program. So as you know, uh, refugees are fleeing from their country because of wars, because of persecution, uh, many reasons that can take to this situation. So um, we need to make it successful exactly, as you said, the integration part of this process. Because migration, refugees policy, asylum policy, but migration in general, it's a very complex policy. Uh, we know that uh, we have to work on, 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 on economic issues, on social issues, also on security issues. This, I mean, also on the, safe routes? Yes, indeed. I mean, it's a priority for us, as you know, as a, as a, as a group. Um, so this idea of the community uh, sponsorship programs, it's, it's, um, it's to focus exactly on integration and to, the, to, 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 to profit from the local communities and from their involvement towards a, a, a decent integration, towards a process that is, I would say, globally positive for the refugees, which are obviously a priority in this, in this situation, but for the community as a whole, also for the local community. That's the sense of this, of this program. And that's also the, the expertise that we'll get today from our guests will, will guide us a little bit around this, 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 idea, this idea, this initiative. That's what we'll be discussing and showing also to our viewers. I, I recently learned in preparation of, of today afternoon that uh, in 2020, 86 percent of the refugees were hosted in developing countries. So we see there is a global uh, issue behind and uh, 73 uh, simply go into neighboring country, which I think it uh, is quite easy to understand why, why this is. Uh, but um, before we, we end up in a, in a debate, you brought also a, a video with you. Yeah. We'll have a video to show, but I think you pointed out to a very significant uh, uh, numbers. Uh, I mean, asylum uh, uh, is a basic right to, to all human beings, and that comes from the Geneva Convention from decades ago. And uh, we as Europeans, we have to do our part. And you pointed out correctly, many times it's the, 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 the neighboring countries that are helping those in need. And we as Europeans, we must do our part, certainly. But let's look at this video and let's see how we can inspire ourselves for the rest of the discussion. Community sponsorship is a groundbreaking approach to helping refugees find safety. This approach brings small groups of local citizens together to welcome newcomers into their communities. This is another part of just being part of a global community, being aware of other people and ourselves. And the reciprocal relationship is really exciting. Tens of thousands of people in a growing number of countries have taken part in community sponsorship programs to date. Others are working to launch similar programs. We are seeing amazing results, a positive impact in big cities and small towns. 
a family will now be identified for us. It's... This is giving grassroots ordinary people the responsibility for the entire journey that a family goes on from when they land at an airport through to them being completely resettled, integrated, happy. People live in the area where the refugees are going to live as well, so they're part of that community. We've discovered there are people in the community who have all sorts of skills to contribute. Estamos todos para tratar de integrar a gente que no eligió salir de su país, tuvo que salir de su país. No es solo al refugiado, es a la sociedad que la hace crecer, la hace estar más unida. One of the most important things in settlement is jobs. We actually need immigration from a workforce point of view. So my advice to business is to get involved either through providing mentor groups to help do the settlement or through hiring. Having things brought down to a community level really personalizes the whole issue. It combines the numbers with the integration capacity, so it not only increases the possibility of more resettlement places, but also looks to the quality of those resettlement places. Hoy le toca a este grupo desplazarse. Tal vez el día de mañana me tocará a mí. Y ojalá llegue el día en que nadie tenga que salir forzadamente de su país. Entonces creo que hemos ganado en sensibilidad y en humanidad. The experience that we've had in Canada is that community-sponsored refugees tend to do really well, integrate very quickly into their host community. But the other thing is that the host communities are transformed by these refugees. I know for my children, it's been a real humbling experience for them as well. They will have grown up knowing that their family have been involved with bringing a family over from a country where life was very dangerous. They're very willing to be part of the community, yeah. to get involved in things, and it has been great to have them as part of the community. I mean, basically, they're going to be our friends for the rest of our lives. It is personal to help people be at home here in a place that I absolutely love. So that's my absolute dream, really. Thank you, Pedro, for bringing this uh, video. I think it was in informative, but also touching and giving a good image uh, what spirit is also uh, behind. So maybe we should switch now to the two experts which we have today. Let's do it, let's do it. I think we should follow, but I think it was really inspiring. So please, if you want to introduce so, them. Maybe just to say also to, to everybody who, who is with us, we have experts invited, but also members of the European Parliament and from the Committee of the Regions, which will we, be with us today. So maybe first we welcome Kathleen Cassia Ficas, which is, she is policy advisor of the International Center for Migration and Policy Development, so the ICMPD which was founded in 1993, which uh, was a follow-up of an initiative in my home country, Austria, and in Switzerland. And the organization was cre created also to, res to serve as a support <coughs> mechanism for informal consultation and to provide expertise uh, and efficient services on migration and asylum issues. And uh, Kat uh, Caitlin recently also contributed to, to a to a paper on community sponsorship. And then the second expert, which we will have uh, later on the matter, is David Manicum, the special advisor of the complementary, pa pa complementary pathway and community sponsorship at the UN Refugee Agency. He, uh, David is representing also the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative today, a multi-stakeholder partnership that includes also UNHCR. And so he will also take uh, uh, this on this, we are proud to have both uh, uh, with us. I think they will give us an, a, an perfect uh, insight on the issue and a lot of ideas. Yeah, indeed. It's great that they are with us. Thank you so much. And if you allow me, I will start with the first question to Caitlin. Caitlin, in a recent commentary, uh, you mentioned the need to understand community sponsorship as a network to facilitate the mobility, the integration of refugees. Can you explain that idea to us? 
Absolutely. And uh, first, I'd like to say thank you uh, for your initiative uh, to think more about how community sponsorship can be applied to support inclusive communities in Europe. And thank you for having me. I'm happy to, to be here to discuss this important topic, which I think is one with a lot of potential. So we at ICMPD are part of a large research project that puts networks at the center of our thinking on uh, solutions for and by refugees. And we see that, like everyone else, refugees have a variety of networks, including family, friends, and business associates and our research has found that the quality of refugees networks is especially important for determining whether these networks can unlock opportunities such as access to jobs, housing, or information. Um, however, we also see that uh, experiences of conflict and displacement um, can disrupt these connections, meaning that refugees might have weaker networks, but where refugees lack strong networks, organizations can come in and help build them up. So these are two of the reasons why I think community sponsorship is uh, especially uh, an exciting initiative. It offers the opportunity for a variety of people and actors in Europe to take an active role in welcoming refugees in a tangible way, and also to, to be involved in building networks to support refugees in coming to Europe and to help refugees settle in once they arrive and also to help refugees build up their own networks here in Europe. So as reflected in the video we just saw, uh, for refugees coming through community sponsorship programs, sponsors are a key source of support, helping newcomers to find housing and employment, learn the language, and navigate their new environment. Uh, in this process, sponsors are linking newcomers to services, information, and people. And in this way, they provide a setting for refugees to build relationships and supportive networks in their new communities and more broadly to build bridges between newcomers and other community members. Uh, many programs help refugees to create new networks and, and some allow sponsors to name who they will sponsor, uh, for instance, providing an opportunity to bring extended family members who would not qualify for family reunification. So in this way, uh, sponsorship can also leverage the existing networks that refugees have. So uh, networks are really core to the concept and strength of the community sponsorship approach to refugee mobility and integration. And the research available illustrates that it helps refugees to access key services and can also lead to uh, better employment and earnings outcomes. So uh, may, 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 maybe better if you allow then I put the next question to David, our uh, second expert today, because I think we all uh, in, want to give, uh, see also the answer. What is the difference between community sponsorship and classical ways of uh, volunteer works and volunteering? So David, welcome here. Thank you very much. Can you hear me clearly? Perfect. Yeah, perfectly. Go ahead. Great. It's, it's great to be here, and I'm inspired to be speaking to a group of European parliamentarians given, the, given the, the great development in the area of community sponsorship over the last five or six years. I spent most of my career with the Government of Canada, um, where community sponsorship was part of what we, we did uh, as a country for, for 40 years since the Vietnamese boat uh, people movement. Five or six years ago when we started to work um, as part of the global refugee sponsorship initiative with new sponsorship programs we were working off variations on the canadian model that's no longer the case there are active community sponsorship programs in the united kingdom in ireland in germany in spain in belgium new programs being developed in portugal programs in argentina new zealand so we're now in a space where we have multiple model variants to learn from to build in the best way possible a lot of people are interested in this question, how does sponsorship differ from volunteering? Volunteering, of course, is, is a wonderful addition to the overall integration network and capacity building. But sponsorship does do something more than that. It, it's, it's a legal contract, if you will, between government and citizens to provide support for refugees in a, that responsibilizes um, citizens and the groups they put together. They're responsible for, for financial support often. They're responsible for finding housing. They've got a one or two year commitment to do a, a, a set and defined um, number of activities in support of the refugees. And our experience in Canada, and we see this developing um, also in, in European countries, is that creates a, a depth of, of commitment and belonging to the program that is different from volunteering. And it creates, um, powerful advocates for refugees that start to develop these networks with an amplifying effect um, that, Caitlin, that Caitlin spoke about. Um, 
government does some things well and private citizens do some things well. And each country is working on a slightly different recipe as how to divide those responsibilities. But I think that's the fundamental difference. A group of citizens have said to their government, government has its role, it will do these things. We will take on this other set of activities in support of this family. And we're, we're making a contractual uh, um, commitment. And we think that does create a deeper and more profound social um, contract that leads to, and this is the goal of the overall goal, right? To increase the overall quality and quantity of reception and integration capacity in our societies for people who have lost their, their homes and need a safe new home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Now I will probably go back to Caitlin. And Caitlin, I would like to ask, I mean, apparently from what we have already heard, um, the issue here that the, the Secretary is really going local. But at the same time, we need to have the ambition to expand, to expand particularly uh, uh, these community sponsorships of, of refugees uh, throughout Europe. So how can we expand and how can networks help us expanding these projects in Europe? What, what is your view on this? Thank you. Sure, a very important question. Um, so yes, community sponsorship uh, has the potential to increase the number of refugees admitted to Europe uh, through legal pathways and also to foster their inclusion, which is even more important uh, given the rising number of people displaced globally and a growing gap in solutions. Um, I would say for the potential of sponsorship to be more fully tapped, increasing the number of countries and also the number of communities within these countries uh, is really essential. Uh, community sponsorship can be part of refugee resettlement efforts, but also for refugees arriving uh, for other reasons, such as people coming for study, for work, or for family reunification. And I think we've seen an increasing acknowledgement of this uh, in the, the policy sphere. Uh, at the same time, it's also important to increase the number and the range of actors who are involved in community sponsorship. Uh, faith groups have long paid, played an active role here. Universities are increasingly involved as well. So getting other community groups involved, including diaspora organizations and also employers, uh, would help to increase the number of sponsors and also the, expand the diversity of networks, which can help open up more opportunities for sponsored refugees. Uh, networks can also be an important way for sponsors to share information and learn from each other's experiences, which can be a valuable uh, source of support and information. Uh, but uh, as the name suggests, and as you mentioned, uh, communities are really at the core of community sponsorship. Uh, but networking isn't just important for individuals. Uh, organizations can also exchange information about their programs, experiences, challenges, and ideas, and also to share these with policymakers. And uh, last but not least, I think that the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative is a great example. Uh, we saw their video. Uh, and it's really an initiative of different organizations coming together to promote the creation and expansion of community sponsorship around the world and to provide information on what this could look like in different places. Because as, as David mentioned, they do look different in different communities uh, to be responsive to these different contexts. And in this way, networks can also be important for promoting the uptake of community sponsorship. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe before I ask a, a, a question also to, to our David, uh, I want to invite all of you watching also, if you want to participate in the debate, just put your questions, remarks in the, in the, in the uh, comment box of, 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 of your online media. And also, if, if, you, if you have any experience in which you want to share with us politically, we also very happy if you put it in, so it is not only at one side, we're also happy to receive a lot of uh, input from, from, from the audience. So, David, uh, you already referred a little bit on the issue of relation between state responsibility, which normally is uh, refugee issues, and this private initiative. So, uh, how you see this relation as private citizens take over some responsibilities, which uh, also this, the state should uh, take uh, responsibility in generally uh, uh, on and uh, maybe secondly, I, I wanted to know how, how many people are already citizens are involved in these uh, networks. Well, I'll answer the. Thanks very much. For those, those are great questions. The the second question is the harder one to answer, um, and it varies a great deal because in Europe the, the programs are relatively new and still relatively small. The sponsorship of it, of an individual refugee in the in the different programs around Europe 
normally involve either small groups of individuals coming together for the specific purpose of sponsoring a refugee, often it's five or seven or 10, or pre-existing organizations, say a church parish, um, or I think sports clubs would be a great, a great way to expand. They could get competitive about uh, sponsoring more refugees than their, than their fellows, um, or, or schools or community, uh, existing community organizations, which sometimes will therefore have a large number of people involved. The experience of most refugee sponsorship activities is that you end up with a core group that are the contractual signatories with government to perform the responsibilities and they end up building a network around them. You heard a couple of references in the video about how community sponsorship helps people discover their, their own communities. And a lot of organizations that are passionate about sponsorship also speak to the benefits of the community, finding out that the, the neighbor a few a little ways down the street who you never knew very well, actually is a retired violin teacher and would love to give free violin lessons to a refugee child who had, had been studying the instrument and then had lost the ability to when they lost their home. And then they get to know each other and build new community connections. But when we're talking with organizations, particularly in Europe, and I might say particularly on what we might call the left part of the political spectrum, there is concern that sponsorship means government, you know, delegating its responsibilities or giving up responsibilities and, 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 and turning things over to the private sector in an unhealthy way. I think the answer to that is complex, but it's all about program design. In all of our societies, we make slightly different choices as to along the spectrum of what is the responsibility of state government, of local government, and of private citizens. Um, and here, community sponsorship, you know, governments don't really do it to save money. Community sponsorship saves some costs, but in most countries, the goal is to increase the overall scale of the resettlement program. So most governments are actually investing more money. This is particularly true in my home country. I was a very senior official in the Department of Immigration and Refugee and Citizenship in Canada and additional community sponsorship commitments by government cost government a lot of money. The community organization does provide a lot of support, including some financial support. The government is taking on all of the, the health and social services and longer term costs of integration, education and so forth. Um, so government, I've never heard of a government get into this to save money. They get into it to build deeper, more welcoming communities and to build the overall capacity of their, of their system to integrate refugees well. Refugees have widely varying sorts of needs. And community sponsorship should be seen as an additional tool to have available. Um, government's very good at some things like formal language training. Um, government isn't so good at informal language conversation circles that might work better for an elderly person or for a mother with a number of children who can't attend formal language training very well. And government's not very good at helping a refugee family figure out how to help their child in the local school system, help with their homework, figure out how to get them signed up for soccer and so forth. So when well designed, and we're all working on perfecting the design and now we've got a great laboratory in Europe as different countries um, develop programs and learn from the early experiences. It's not about government getting rid of its responsibilities. It's government figuring out how best to use the, the connective tissue and welcoming enthusiasm and friendship of their, of their communities, other their private citizens to, for as a overall social polity, do the job better. I'll, I'll leave it there, thanks. Thank you, thank you so much, David. Really interesting uh, perspective on, on this, uh, this idea of government handling the issue or, or delegating <coughs> or just sharing responsibilities with the local communities. Really, really, really interesting view that you brought us. Now, thank you to both of you. Uh, we'll have now um, a set of questions from our colleagues MEPs and then also from, from our, uh, the participants in the, in the, in the social media. So, but I, I will start with our three colleagues MEPs that uh, 
uh, have uh, proposed themselves to, to bring some questions to the audience now, to the, to, the, to the experts now. So colleagues from our working group, for migration working group. First of, first of all, it will be Birgit Sippel, our coordinator in the Committee of Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. The second question will come from Thijs Reuten. He's, our, he's from Netherlands and he's also a member of the Civil Liberties and Home Affairs Working Group. And the third question will come from Isabel Santos. She's a colleague uh, that also comes from Portugal, as, as I do. And she's not only the Civil Liberties and Justice and Home, Home Affairs Committee member uh, here at the Parliament, but, uh, Parliament, but also uh, she also belongs to the Human Rights Committee. So it's really interesting. And this perspective is also interesting to be brought to the, to the, to the discussion. So, Birgit, the floor is yours for the first question, please. Uh, thank you very much. And let me first state that, of course, we are all very happy to learn about additional points to improve our asylum migration system and to improve uh, integration of people. But listening to the last sentences of David, to be honest, all this reminds me of what in my home region is already happen happening by volunteers. They are talking to the refugees. They are doing this everyday language course. They are helping with the everyday behavior. They are going to administrative challenges. All this is happening by volunteers. So my question is, nevertheless, with all the explanations you gave, isn't it that the difference between volunteering and sponsorship is that with a sponsorship, you are more bound to do something and you also have to give the money for part of the project. So it's more binding, it's more responsibility for volunteers, and you also have to give um, the money. So in one way or the other, I think involvement of citizens and organizations is important. It could be seen, that's my question to you, as projects to give ideas to others how to improve accommodation and integration of people, that's helpful. Regarding the question of giving money, my question would be, what is your experience for how much time is it expected that via sponsorship, uh, the individual refugee migrant is paid for, for accommodation, for everything else in everyday life? And is there a limit that you can look for? Thank you. Thank you, Birgit. Interesting questions you pose. And now the floor to Thais. Thais, the floor is yours for a question as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pedro. And first of all, uh, I admire uh, the work that you have been doing, David, and also Caitlin. And uh, let me grab the chance to also compliment everyone who might be listening that is already active in one way or the other in uh, reception of, of refugees, in helping refugees out to, to build up their life again. Because... I know from my local experience as an uh, as an elderman in Amsterdam uh, how how valuable that is because it really gives as 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 David also points out depth and 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 added value in in also positive long term effects for for the life of a refugee family who builds up the life again in a in a, in a new city. Let me come to my question because I would um, want to ask you without without um, telling from my own experience first, but I want to ask you, what is in your view the ideal community to sponsor, to do a sponsorship? Is there an ideal community? Could it be done in every type of community? And are there any specific pitfalls from your experience that new starters, uh, so to speak, or existing volunteer projects that want to, to grow, to grow into a sponsorship uh, could learn from? Thank you. Thank you, Thais. A very interesting question. The, 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 the conditions at the local community that are proper to, to host the refugees, that's a, a very interesting one. And also Isabel Santos. Now, Isabel, the floor is yours for the third question, please. Thank you, Pedro, and thank you to our uh, guests um, for the, the very interesting uh, remarks. And I would like to raise some questions because, uh, as you know, uphold the, the rights of migrants and refugees is something very important, but uh, we need to go more to the concrete, to the daily life, and uh, how can we uh, make these rights real uh, rights. And uh, it was very interesting that in, in last, on last year was published um, 
study by the National Integration Evaluation System that indicated that uh, there were positive dynamics um, in Europe in what is related with the school, security, health, and education, but that, that remains a, a need of progress in what is related with housing. Uh, among uh, um, other areas. And the uh, housing, it's of course one of the, the rights uh, that we have um, uh, more difficulties to, uh, to undertake in our communities. Uh, by your um, experience, David, uh, in, in the case of Canada, what is your uh, experience in this uh, in this area? How do you see? Um, how can we go further in grant the right of housing and, uh, of course, give housing conditions to to people that is in particular vulnerability, as are the refugees and and migrants in our communities? I would like to to hear you about this and um, how the communities can help uh, and provide this right and, uh, of course, about the responsibility of state and, in our case, European Union as a group of states providing conditions uh, for, for the concretization of this right. Thank you very much. Pedro, if I may, I, yes, I will now go also to the questions which we received through the internet. Uh, we get it directly on our mobile phone via WhatsApp, so we are not lazy uh, on the mobile phone. We are getting your uh, questions here. The one from Bettina Vollert, which is also a, a member of the European Parliament, and she's uh, probably watching us uh, uh, online, has uh, there's a question to... Caitlin, uh, what does migration policy mean to you? Integration of refugees and migrants in the country of migration or repatriation to the home country? What strategies does the Center for Migration propose on this issue? And uh, the other question is to uh, David, uh, which is also, as we are the global progressive forum, also let's say the global perspective, as you are Canadian, uh, and ca Canada always had been very strongly involved in migration. What are, uh, uh, as a native-born Canadian, what are the priorities in the area of migration and education? What, let's say, can European, European countries and Europeans learn from Canada in this respect? Yeah, great questions, Andreas. And now the, the floor back to our guests. First, Caitlin, and then David, please, Caitlin. Do you want to answer the questions that uh, were posed, please? Sure, thank you. Uh, yes, so regarding the first question, uh, just something quick. I know I'm sure David will have more to say, um, but I think I agree that uh, the people and community members really play a key role in connecting newcomers to a range of integration related supports and um, in exchange for, for their money, time, commitment, I think it's also really important that their support provided to them um, related to, you know, information about the experiences that refugees have had before leaving experience of flight, also what it's like to be moving to a new community and, and how these different processes work and resources that are available in, in the receiving communities. Um, and uh, whether there's an ideal community uh, that can participate in such a program, uh, I think because it is community driven, it's really important and the local context is, is really essential to shaping it. So they might look different in, in different places, as was mentioned. Um, but I would say some factors that are, are especially important, I think, given what we know so far in evaluations are uh, looking at uh, availability of particular services to learn the language, for instance, uh, jobs that are, are available as well, and also ways to ensure that people are not isolated, which, of course, having community sponsorship there as a network is something that's helped to address that. And uh, I think integration in this context is really uh, it's connecting people to services. Uh, that they, they need to settle in to make a new life, uh, to navigate living in a new place, because you know moving to a new place really does change every facet of your daily experience. Um, it's also meeting people, uh, meeting people outside of also this kind of more institutionalized uh, setting, such as you know service provision. So I think that uh, really engaging, building meaningful relationships is something that can help people to settle in and also take an active role and get really involved in their community. And, and that's a great goal to have. 
Thank you. And now, uh, David, the floor is yours for, for the many questions that were posed to you, please. Yeah, I, I was hoping for easier questions and everyone's asked very, uh, very acute one. They're really, really good questions. It is, it's a bit hard to give a blanket answer to how, how it differs from volunteering and whether it's better or different in kind than volunteering. And I'd like to try to give a nuanced answer and thinking of it as, as a spectrum of activities. The sponsorship contract, especially when you get groups that become repeat sponsors and set up a, an organization with some degrees of specialization about welcoming newcomers into their communities and sponsor a number of newcomers every year. Um, in Canada there, and this is also happening in the UK, you have, you have organizations that are doing that. Um, they do develop a high degree of specialization and then reaching out into their community for volunteers and other types of specialized support, depending on refugee needs. So um, sponsorship organizations do need support. They do need training. They need, they need ways to share experiences amongst themselves and so forth. But sponsorship, as opposed to volunteering, appears to provide generally, not always, a continuity for the refugee, a degree of, of stability and certainty that volunteering may not be able to provide, and also appears to be particularly effective about access to labor market. For reasons which researchers continue to, to work on, but I think that most of us thinking back probably didn't get our very first job when we were a teenager through a government employment program. Usually it's through a, a series of, of connections that community sponsorship groups seem to be particularly good at. During the very large Operation Refugee Syria in Canada, when Canada resettled 40,000 Syrians in a very short period of time, I was, I was there in the planning phase. And so think of that as 600,000 resettlements in European per capita terms. We had the chance to effectively by accident to have control groups because we had Syrians from the same part of Syria being brought to Canada people of identical profile being brought to Canada as government assisted refugees and as privately sponsored refugees. And there did appear to be a pretty consistent, um, more rapid entry into the labor market with those um, who, are, who are community sponsored. This is not at all to suggest that volunteering isn't a crucial part of the overall spectrum of support for refugees, uh, not at all. Um, is there an ideal type of sponsorship group? I don't. I can barely start into that <laughs> that question, my friends. It would we could have a special seminar on that. Um, I would I would just again say that Europe right now is an invaluable laboratory. Somebody asked about you know Europe learning from Canada. Well, the learning can certainly happen in both directions. Um, faith based organizations tend to be very good at this for a variety of reasons. I think because of the way they're structured and because of the, the nature of their their beliefs um, in, in, a welcoming, um, in a welcoming way. Um, but for example, universities in Canada have proven a very powerful tool. You can raise, you talked about the, the, the raising of money. Um, there are a number of Canadian universities where every student pays one or two dollars, a very small amount of money, but with a large student body to sponsor refugees every year. And they set up a, a coordinating committee and, and use the resources of the large campus to help integrate refugees who are also students into their, into their, into their world. We are working actively with the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative in several countries to try to expand the base of sponsorship. And I hope that European countries will help us all understand how to reach into other parts of society better. I spoke of sports clubs. We can think of other examples of already existing natural you know, sub-communities groupings that could be very effective um, at welcoming the stranger in a, in a, in a, in a holistic uh, way, sort of use that over, overused term. De-isolation, uh, Caitlin mentioned, I think is what you hear about over and over again from refugees who are sponsored. It doesn't mean that refugees coming through government programs are always end up isolated, but community sponsorship does prefer seem to provide a de-isolating context. You'll see repeated references to eating together, taking meals together, refugees inviting their sponsors over to share their, 
their home cooking is a, a very repeated theme. And there is no more de-isolating effect perhaps um, than, than breaking bread together. Housing is a very big question, a very big issue. Um, too complex to go into here and, and not only complex because I don't know the answer to the complexities. As we know, housing is a systemic challenge in most developed economies right now for a wide variety of reasons with a number of, of complicated analyses. Um, most countries can and should be very careful to make sure that refugees don't you know, jump the queue for social housing. That is not a way to build community support for integrating refugees. Community sponsorship groups do tend to find to be successful finding housing. It is often that the community reaching out to someone who knows someone who has an apartment that's available, who's willing to rent it at a little bit below market value for the first year to get the refugees settled, or a variety of solutions appear. But I don't want to I don't want to under understate this as a problem. This is really where we need good research evolving new practices in the in the new European programs to find the solution to that. You know, organizations like Airbnb are donating many thousands of nights of short term accommodation for newly arriving refugees, but that's not the longer term solution to this challenge. If we don't get good at fig figuring this one out, it can be an inhibiting uh, factor for refugee resettlement in general and community sponsorship. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. There's a big question about learning from Canada. Uh, my last job, I was Assistant Deputy Minister for Settlement and Integration. I think all I would say there is that federal governments need to be very thoughtful in developing um, model, relationship models with cities and, and subnational governments. Very small amounts of funding can set up networks within communities to help all newcomers, including refugees, uh, work better by ensuring that you've got your education people, your police services, your health services, your schools and so forth in a town or even in a neighborhood, sitting down together regularly to figure out what are the barriers to successful integration. Thank you. Thank you both for your expiring uh, um, remarks or experiences which we could share. And I think it's a, it's a good afternoon because it is an afternoon where we discuss about how we can make a success out of the question. Usually in politics it's discussed as a problem. I think we have a positive debate. But we are already, let's say, a little bit late, but stay tuned. We are not finished with the program. We have also people from the ground, uh, from the, uh, let's say, committee of the regions. Indeed, indeed, Andres. I think it's a really good idea to wrap up with this vision coming from the Committee of the Regions because they, they can bring us the vision from the ground, indeed, as you said. So let us talk to Ante Grotier. Ante is a colleague from the Committee of the Regions and is also a rapporteur for the new Pact on Migration, Plus on Integration and Inclusion. Ante, uh, are you joining, joining us online? Yeah. Yes, I am. So yeah, yeah. Maybe you can just, see me. Hello. Ante is also from Bremen and responsible there as vice uh, president of the Bürgerschaft, which is the parliament. So, hello, Ante. Yeah, hello. Nice to meet you. Hi, nice to see you. Please. So, uh, do, you, do you want me to give a brief, yes. a brief uh, introduction? Okay. Yes, uh, so, uh, the, um, idea, the idea is for us to have your, uh, your best, I mean, what you think are the best practices in terms of integration of, of, of refugees in the communities. That's, that's certainly the idea. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me just, just do two sentences about the migration and integration policy of the European Union and the report I made, because I think that's very important to see that um, we, as a committee of regions, really wanted the European Commission to take into consideration what we do as groundwork, you see, because there is no integration without the cities and the communities, which are on a local basis. And it doesn't work if you say something on a federal level. You have to, you have to talk to the people on the ground because they make integration work. And that is the point I wanted to talk about. Um, as you can see, we, we are testing since, I think, 2019, a program which is called NEST, which stands for New Start in a Team, with, which is some sort of uh, sponsorship. And these, we have some mentors who provide refugees with housing, 
uh, for example, pay the rent or provide accommodation for two years, and they support refugees in practical advice and assistance for one year. For example, dealing with uh, official paperwork uh, or opening a bank account and things like that. But um, this is for only a special group of people. Because of our social welfare system, all refugees have, um, you know, have money or have, have accommodation, which is normally provided by our local, by our regions, or our, our local governments. So uh, we think the most important thing is to get them into contact uh, with uh, civil society. Because that is nothing any any other one can do than social, social society, civil society here with us, and uh, we support several initiatives financially for their work um, with the refugees. And I just wanted to mention two because I think we're running out of time. One is called Fluchtraum Bremen, which is um, an institution which uh, especially cares for young adults. You know, as minors. We have a special system for minors because they have to be taken care of. They are not legally responsible for what they do. But the time they get 18, they normally use all those benefits. And so we have to have special offers for them because, of course, as you all know, people who just got 18 and are in a foreign country are not able to live lives on their own. They need even more support if they are responsible for themselves. So they have lots of support from these um, from this um, institution, uh, which helps them to find jobs, uh, which helps them to find apprenticeships, so they can they can have uh, better, even better jobs, which helps them to support uh, um, for for special programs for traineeships and so on, um, uh, which helps them to to do all the official work, all the 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 paperwork they have to do because they are normally not. Uh, able to do that on their own, even after two or three years in Germany and after um, going to attending school and so on. And the other one, which I wanted to mention, is the Bremer Rat for Integration, which is like the Bremen Council for Integration. Um, this organization was founded in 2005 in order to strengthen the integration of people with a migration background. And what is more important is that all people working in there have a migration background themselves. So we have people from almost all over the world working in this council, uh, and they are very, very easily able to get in contact with all uh, refugees, and uh, they know the needs, and they know the difficulties people face when they, when they approach our way of, of life, or very formalized way of life. And uh, they have several programs. They engage themselves, for example, in, in uh, programs applying for citizenships in our initiatives. Um, they engage themselves in, in cultural programs. They have contact to all those diaspora organizations, which David mentioned earlier. So, so they really get in touch with all the young and the older people arriving in Bremen uh, to make it possible for them to find peers who can understand their needs, who can understand their problems, because our way of living is maybe different from the way they had before. Things works and work in a different way, and they can they have the understanding of how it worked in their uh, former countries and how it works here, so they can help them understand the differences and they can help them uh, get um, over, over all the burdens they have to get over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antje. It's, it's really interesting that you brought this experience really from the ground and involving the people that were already in the past migrants as well and working with those that are now hosted in, in, your, in your city. Thank you for that. Uh, we have two more colleagues from the Committee of the Regions in this final part of our webinar and they will bring their experience as well. So it's the idea of the diversity of experiences that we try to bring to your, to your knowledge. And uh, these are two colleagues, so it's Joan Calabui Grul from Valencia in Spain and then Stavros Tavernides from uh, Cyprus. So Joan, the floor to you for, for two minutes and then to Stavros, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and now, uh, what we are doing is uh, working uh, in the frame of work of the refugee uh, resettlement programs or uh, opening uh, pro uh, protection to the refugees. 
Uh, we are working with the Ministry of Inclusion, Social Security and Migration uh, to give uh, protection to, uh, in this moment, five families of a total of 23 beneficiaries of international protection uh, in this uh, framework of the National Resettlement Program. And uh, the, this program is developing in uh, uh, five municipalities uh, of the, our region, uh, different municipalities. We are working with uh, uh, some uh, organization of the Catholic Church, concretely Caritas, and uh, with the funds of the Spanish government and the regional government. These uh, five uh, Syrian families uh, are, uh, came from Lebanon, as, uh, from refugee camps of Lebanon, and we uh, fully support them with uh, teachers to learn language, counselors to help them to manage the money. And uh, of course, uh, we promote a network of contacts uh, with uh, the different uh, elements of their communities to have uh, relations with all of them, associations, cultural uh, associations, sports associations of these areas. And of course, and of course, they, uh, the, the, the children are fully integrated in the educational system. And in addition, in our region, we have a universal health care system. It means that uh, for the first minute, all of them, they are in our health uh, public systems to be uh, to receive the protection of uh, of uh, our uh, our region. Uh, uh, I think, uh, as as so you much. know, oh, oh, okay, it's okay. Thank, Thank you so you. much for sharing the experience. Really interesting. And uh, now the floor to Stavros. Stavros, the floor is yours, please, for for, for presenting your experience as well in Cyprus. Yeah, dear friends, Cyprus being an external border of the European Union and in geographical proximity to conflict zones, constantly welcomes migrants reaching European soil by all means. Integrating migrants is a difficult task, even more so in a country where we, are, we still have a long way to go to recover from the economic crisis, not to mention the pandemic and its consequences. I am proud to say that local authorities in Cyprus have been very active in implementing projects that promote social inclusion of migrants despite difficulties in terms of competences, funding or human resources. It's not surprising that these projects are almost exclusively sponsored by European funds. Some of the most successful and ongoing in Cyprus are the Intercultural Center of Nicosia Municipality, the Open School of Ayos Athanasios Municipality, as well as the program named Limazon, One City, the Whole World, run in cooperation of several municipalities in Limassol District. These projects are some examples of the work carried out by Cypriot local government in the field of social inclusion focusing on two main pillars, helping refugees acquire labor market skills and promoting intercultural events. Those programs focus on providing refugees with skills aiming to help them not only adjust to their everyday life in Cyprus, but also equipping them for the labor market. It is our responsibility as local government to include these people into our local communities and eradicate the phenomena of social inclusion, exclusion of migrants. It is the only win-win approach for all members of our community. Thank you. Thank you, three, uh, very much for, for your insight from the Gracias Antje, Joan Kalapuch and uh, Stavros. I, I think it was very important to have your insights and experiences here. But we already spent more than we planned. We planned to, to spend uh, maybe until uh, 5.15. We already over time, but it's, I think it's, it's worth. So I will Indeed. not lose any time. I will immediately yeah. give to Pedro. Thank you, Andreas. We are wrapping up now. So thank you to all of those that followed us online and all the participants, all, the, all our experts, but also the MEPs and the, the invitees that we had from the Committee of the Regions. Thank you to all that follows us uh, in our website and in YouTube as well. Thank you for the interest. And please don't forget that asylum 
is a fundamental right and an international obligation. Let us as Europeans never forget that we need this policy and it's a fundamental right that comes from a convention with decades that we should respect and honor. And uh, as often in life, uh, where there is a will, there is a way. That's exactly what we should think and, and, and act as such. So let us make sure we live up to our obligations and find ways of making the integration of refugees a success in Europe. Before we go offline, I would just give the floor once more to Caitlin, since I know that she would like to bring our attention to the Vienna conference next week that they are organizing. So thanks again to all of you. And please, Caitlin, the floor is yours to wrap up. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I just wanted to highlight that uh, next week on the 19th and 20th of October, we're having our annual Vienna Migration Conference, which this year focuses on reimagining migration partnerships, uh, challenges, opportunities, and strategies. So I invite you all to join if you wish, um, and we'll uh, put the link in the chat in case you would like to RSVP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caitlin. And so bye-bye to you all. See you next time. Bye.